Cougs house, the Houston Cougars fall victim to the fog. But I'm here to tell you, I'm not that worried. You are Locked On Cougs, your daily podcast on the Houston Cougars, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Lockdown Cougs, daily podcast about your Houston Cougars. I'm your host, Houston-born teacher and coach, Parker Andrews, here to break down all things Cougs. If you're a U of H fan or just a hater who came to stop by, please be sure to subscribe down below. That way you can lay us on Cougs in your news feed each and every day. We appreciate you making Lockdown Cougs your first listen of the day. If you're on YouTube, welcome back, and it's so good to see you again. Remember, doing a giveaway every 200 subscribers. The next one of those is... At 2000, we're at just over 1970. We're so, so close. Hit subscribe. Help us get there. Like and comment the video. Let us know you're in the contest. If you don't know what to say after talking about the beatdown that happened in Lawrence, Kansas on Saturday, tell us what your favorite type of pen is. Is your favorite like ballpoint pen, the Bic? What's your favorite type of pen? All right. So today's episode got a couple of things going on. Um, First and foremost, got to break down what went wrong for Houston against Kansas. There's a handful of things. I don't think it's as long of a list as people on Twitter would make you feel like it was, but there are a handful of things that went wrong for Houston. The second segment, I'll look at where Houston goes from here. And then last, but certainly not least, I want to talk some about where this puts the Houston Cougars with a P poll coming out in the middle of the day, Monday, in the grand scheme of the Big 12, and kind of in the landscape of college basketball because – we're looking at big, big deals here, and it's also still just early February. But first, if you were under a rock, if you forgot about it, if you did some forgettable things since Saturday and don't remember it because of them, Houston did lose to Kansas 78-65 to in Fog Island Fieldhouse. Um, I will say there were moments where the game was not 13 points close. There were moments in the game where it felt like Houston was a runaway from being closer than that. Uh, Kansas opened the game going nine of their first 10 from the field. Uh, Houston had a two point lead in the first 20 seconds. And that was the only time they led this basketball game. I want to talk a little bit about what went wrong in this one. And it is that rough start. I'm going to start with that rough start and it's Kansas shooting the ball. So unbelievable at the gate fed off the energy of the crowd. It was a raucous crowd. Um, you know, Self said he thought, uh, Bill Self, the Kansas basketball coach, said he thought it was the best crowd they'd had this year. And they've had UConn through there, five other Big 12 games. I mean, that's, that's a highly touted stuff, frankly, for that Houston should feel respected after that, right? Um, they make nine of the first 10. Um, and I will point out that five of their first makes in the first 10 minutes, when they get up by 10, 23 to 13 at the 10 minute mark, Five of their makes had a Houston Cougar within a half arm's length away contesting the shot. I mean, they really were just shooting over the top. And you could argue that a length is going to help with that, obviously. But that's five makes, a couple of them for three, with a Houston Cougar right there contesting the shot. And they had 23 points 10 minutes in. Um, I will point out they also had another shot within that first 10-minute span that was a putback on a miss where a Houston Cougar was also an arms of the way. So you feel me on how like Houston really was contesting and playing strong that first 10 minute run. Kansas just shot the lights out and Houston did not Whether the storm. Uh, there was also the sequence where like Houston feels like they're making a run. Jamal Shea gets a breakaway layup. I think he debated dunking it on the way up. I have not talked to him. I just reading body language there. Um, and he kind of misread how high in the air he was going to be. And, ultimately laid off the back room and went out um, that felt like a gut punch because then Kansas came down and scored and you went from cutting the lead to seven to watching it grow to 11. That's a big four point swing in the, middle of the first half. Um, they did alternate some runs late. Like we scored 10, you know, nine Oh here, they score nine Oh there kind of stuff in the second half. Um, they just could not get it under a 10 point lead in that second half. And the post game, Kelvin himself said that they got hit in the mouth. Bill self again, from Kansas point out that, uh, you know, he knew they were ready to play, but he did not anticipate that good a start. And he was happy about it. Um, that's one thing that went wrong is this initial, you know, onslaught at the beginning, Houston just never was able to recover from part of that's getting to shoot well at home. Part of that's being ready for the moment. And part of that is honestly, like not, I don't mean to say this as a 
thing that Houston will never do or has never done, but you got to kind of at some point dig yourself out of that and kind of dig deep to do it. And Houston couldn't get that done on Saturday. Um, I, I do think one thing that's not being talked about enough is the problem in this game was a Javier Francis injury. I should point out too in the post game, Kelvin Sam said it was his hip. Um, there was initial thought that it might be his head. Uh, people thought it might be his back. Either way, in the first half early in the game, Javier Francis, uh, starting center of the Houston Cougars, goes up for a rebound and has his legs taken out from under him. I don't think it was an intentional play, but it's definitely a very, very violent play where he then hits the ground with the top of his body first. No foul was called on the play, and I understand that I'm I was a little biased in this, but by the book, that's at least a flagrant foul, even if it's not even if it's not intentional. That is a flagrant foul. Um, anyway. Francis has to leave. Houston's already thin at the big guy spot. Uh, Roberts has played most of the entire game in that one. Played 38 minutes in the game. JoJo Tugler comes in and plays a lot of minutes. Plays his butt off. Plays 34 minutes, I should point out. Plays his butt off. Um, covers uh, Dickens, Hunter Dickinson Center. Player of the Year candidate for Michigan. Uh, now at Kansas. Very, very well. But at the end of the day, that is a player of the year candidate. And Tugler is the youngest player in the Big 12. Uh, that, that's a matchup that's going to be hard to handle. Um, and I think that the Francis injury hurt because while Tugler is long, he's inexperienced. And Francis is long and experienced, as at least a lot more so than Tugler is. Um, and with that experience, I mean, Houston continued to double Dickinson. Dickinson being seven foot two, so over the top and passed out of it. I saw a lot of talk online about like, this is why Houston needs a seven footer. And this is, the, and it's like, you know, if I hadn't seen Hunter Dickinson that do that to everybody in America, even Zach Eady, even other big seven footers, I might agree with people there. But the truth is, is that he's seven foot two and he's a future pro. He does that to everyone. And I just, I don't know that that, I think the deal was, is Houston was missing some experience there that would have maybe they don't have to monster double team every single time and maybe didn't have to. Anyway, we'll get to some of that stuff to fix in a second. When we do building from here in the second segment, um, Kansas had a gigantic rebounding advantage. Now, I will say to Houston's credit, the little bit that it deserves here, uh, when Kansas shoots that well, any team shoots that well from the field, there are just less defensive rebounds to get. Now, that that should, you know, mean that Houston then has to just respond by shooting well. They did not. Um and Houston had two guys that rebounded the ball very, very well. Uh, J1 Roberts had 13 rebounds. JoJo Tugler had eight rebounds. The two of them had a combined 12 offensive rebounds. Right. And so you kind of think at one point, oh, that's a good sign. Things should be going our way. However, A, I want to point out that Bill Self said in the post game that Houston had none of their rebound, tap out, kick out for three kind of moments. We've heard Kevin Sanson refer to those as daggers. They're kind of a, a part of the program they love is when they get the offensive rebound, they quickly find sharp cry or shed, sometimes done for three very, very quickly. It's very intentional. It's on purpose. You catch them out of rotation. You catch them out of sorts. You can get an open three for intentional about it. Kansas did not give any of those up to Houston. Houston calls them daggers. There were no daggers of note. Uh, and Bill Self was able to point that in the post game. It's very clearly a moment that they, a, a thing they were focused on. Um, Houston only gave up six offensive rebounds. So I actually feel like you could argue, given the shooting percentage, they defensive rebound the ball well as a team. But truthfully, then I look at the defensive rebounding numbers and Roberts had six. Okay. Good day at the office, especially when you factor in how many offense rebounds he had. Uh, Emmanuel Sharp had one. LJ Cryer had one. JoJo Tugler had three. And that's the list part. That's the entirety of people on the Houston Google roster that had uh, defensive rebounds. And that is a recipe for disaster. That's a problem. Uh, against Texas, for instance, on the road, Jamal Shedd had eight rebounds. Uh, he had none against Kansas. Now, Jamal Shedd carries the brunt of the load for what my last bit of things that went wrong are. Um, and that's just Jamal did not play well, and the offense suffered because of it. Um, the offense was helped some, and the reason the score is as close as it was is because LJ Cryer just got hot in the second half. Um, but the length of Kansas, and I don't know if it's necessarily at the point guard spot, but that seemed to bother Houston at times. And so much so that uh, LJ Cryer and Jamal Shedd barely got to or even tried to shoot at the rim. Um, 
Houston needs to find ways to get Jamal Shedd downhill. And I don't know if that's a Jamal Shedd problem or a Houston Cougar problem, but this team is not its best self if he is not getting to the rim or at least putting pressure on the rim. He's usually speaking one of the best you know, speed and strength combination athletes on the floor. He has to use that to get to the rim to his advantage or else Houston's at a major, major deficit. He had just two field goals made in this game, so you could argue he might need to get involved in scoring more broadly. I would argue as a basketball coach, once you get to the rim and see one or two layups go in, or maybe take a foul, maybe see one or two free throws go in, things can start to roll in other directions for you as well and other areas of the game for you as well. Um, Jamal Shedd needs to get involved. I have ideas in the second segment as far as how to do that. The other guy I would say needs to get involved is uh, Emmanuel Sharp had another game where he shot poorly on the road. He has had rough street nights at BYU. He went 0 for 2 from 3. Neutral site with Dayton, he went 0 5. Uh, at Xavier, he went 1 of 6. At TCU, he went 1 of 4. Neutral with Utah, he went 1 of 4. And then against Kansas, he went 3 and 9. I know you're saying like, 3 and 9 sounds great. That's 33%. But he has had 10 games of shooting 40% better, 40% or better from three this year. Um, eight of those 10 games have been at home. Emmanuel Sharp shoots better at home, but he doesn't have to. Um, if you're only shooting 33% from three, again, that's when I feel like we got to find ways to get to the rim, put some pressure on those rim defenders, put them in a bind. Houston unable to do that. Now, people have been calling for new this, new that new everything in Houston. Well, if you want new everything for your small business, or if you're looking to upgrade that small business or just have a guy come off the bench for your business that maybe comes in and shoots from threes, you need to go to LinkedIn and jobs. Because when you're hiring for your small business, you want to find qualified professionals that are the right fit for that role. That's why I have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn is just is not just some other job board. It's a, got a vast network of more than a billion professionals, billion with a B, which makes it the best place to hire also with a B, best. It gives you access to professionals you can't find anywhere else. LinkedIn does all that while making the process easy and intuitive. LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing uh, thin, so so many people at those small businesses are wearing so many hats, they might not have time to resource to hire. LinkedIn is constantly finding ways to make it easier to hire great candidates. They even have just launched a feature that helps you write a job description, making the process even easier and Quicker post job for free at LinkedIn.com slash locked on college. LinkedIn.com slash locked on college. Post job for free terms and conditions apply. Now, I mentioned that I had some things I would fix for Houston in the third segment. And I call this where to build from here because in con contextualizing this loss, it feels bad for Houston. But realistically, it's a 13 point loss on the road at one of the most historically difficult places to play in all of college basketball and gets a team ranked in the top 10. Now, I could we're going to talk about some ways to build and fix this, but at the end of the day, when you also factor in that Kansas shot 70% from the or 68.9% from the field in this game, I feel like the truth is that one of the ways to fix this might just be play them on a different day and see what happens, right? Like they won't be like that every single time. Um, that's, you know, the beauty of college basketball is that so many one game samples you can get caught up in like, there's some randomness to it. Right. Um, again, five of their makes in the first 10 minutes had a Houston Cougar, a half an arm length away or closer. I mean, that's just ridiculous. Um, okay. Offensively. Got to find ways to tighten this thing up, though, right? Even with how great Kansas shooting the ball, you know, sometimes great shots beat tough defense, so you got to find ways to just score. And one of the things they do that I think works for other guys that I think they should start flipping for Jamal is what's called an Iverson cut. There are Iverson cuts which get LJ Cryer and Manuel Sharp going off of the screen, running laterally parallel to the basket. They catch ball at, like, the free throw line extended. Most coaches call it that the slot area, right? So out there outside the perimeter, outside the three-point line in that area. They do that a lot for LJ and Emmanuel because of how great a shooters they are off the catch, that they're a true triple threat from that spot. Um, Jamal Shedd's a good shooter, but not the same kind of shooter. And so they typically have them distributing the ball. He's a great passer, great assist turnover ratio, et cetera, right? I think in a moment where you're trying to find a basket, 
because Jamal Shedd is your leader. They need to get Jamal Shedd off those same Iverson cuts. That means he's he's the one catching it off the action, uh, coming off the screen in that slot, free throw extended area, able to do some work. You can run empty side pick and rolls with him and J1. Uh, you can let him attack in all that open space on that side of the floor. You can have him attack and flip the lob to a dropped uh, Javier Francis or Jojo Tugler. Get him in more of like a scoring role. Not to say that he needs to become a scoring or a shooting guard or change his position, but Houston is best when he's attacking, and those kinds of actions put other guards on Houston's roster in attacking motions. Uh, we saw them do that some for Marcus last year. Uh, as the leader of this team, especially on a day like Saturday, Houston needs to get Jamal involved in getting to the rim, getting him in the ball in those spots with that much space. I think is a very natural way to do it because they already have it worked within their offense. Um, I would point out also um, that it's interesting to see how they're still integrating Damian Dunn into this offense. And it feels like they're having more and more trouble with it as things go. Um, He just, he has an interesting skill set and it's a score in his own right, but kind of scores best in old school, 15 foot isolation areas. Um, it's interesting because like sometimes he feels like he's fitting really smoothly and he's coming off the screens and running a little short, ro- short pick and rolls uh, from the 15 foot area with the big or whatever. Um, and then sometimes it feels like he's breaking two or three sets in a row to get an ISO bucket and isn't getting, he only played six minutes on Saturday and I'm not in their coaching staff. I'm not in their huddle. I don't know exactly why that is, but I imagine it's because they couldn't risk that coming into play even though he is an effective scorer, right? They need to make sure they're getting the calls and sets they wanted. Malik Wilson played more minutes in his absence. Um, Wilson played 12 minutes. So not like he played a whole lot either. Um, I will also say that one thing Houston continue to build on is that defense Kansas shot the ball extremely well. I get that. Um, but Houston turned them over 18 times compared to having just three turnovers themselves. Even if, if you want to say, Six of Houston's shots were bad shots. And they probably, you could probably find six shots. I know the missed layup from Jamal felt like a turnover, and though it wasn't, right? Um, even if you want to say they missed six shots that were bad shots, they should have either gotten a better shot or whatever. That would, and call those six shots turnovers, they would still have half as many turnovers as they forced out of Kansas, right? Um, for all the you know worry about rebounding, Houston did shoot the ball 24 more times than Kansas. They had nearly uh, they had twice as many than not nearly they had twice as many offensive rebounds as Kansas. The deal was Kansas just didn't miss a lot, so there weren't a lot of rebounds to be had. Um, that wasn't the only deal, but it was certainly a deal, I guess I should say. Now. It was good to see the second half where Cryer shooting came back uh, in a relatively adverse environment. Houston's not been in an environment like that all season and probably won't be until they go back to Fog Allen soon, right, and, uh, next year. But um, it it did it did make it feel like, okay, well, where was this in the first half? Or, okay, if he can step up to the moment, how do we get Emmanuel involved? How do we get other guys to knock down shots on the road? It can't just be these one-guy shows. Um you know, it was Jamal in Austin. Um, I'd argue it was Roberts in, um, in at BYU, but it can't just be these one guy shows. Uh, you got to ha- have more consistent team wide things, multiple guys stepping up when you're on the road, especially at a place like Kansas. Now, I know it feels like crap because we kind of did play like crap, um, but you're halfway through Big 12 play. You and Kansas are both six and three in the conference, and I guess technically they, na- they now have the tiebreaker. Although you're going to see them again at the end of the regular season, um, Kansas has to go to uh, Kansas State on Monday night. They could very well take a fourth loss there. Houston hosts Oklahoma State Tuesday, playing at home, getting back on track. At also point, Oklahoma State is not having a great year. Anybody can beat you is the Big Twelve, but you feel me on that. Um, I. I look at this and think, okay, halfway through the Big 12 count, uh, conference season, they're really doing fine. They're they're tied for the lead in this conference. If you're telling me they go 12 and 6 and are tied for the lead at the end of the regular season of this conference, I'd be ecstatic. That would involve losing three more games. I don't know if they have three more losses in them. They play some talented teams. I always have to go to Baylor, Kansas to get one more time. It's in Houston, but it isn't still a talented Kansas team. Um, 
I just feel like if you told me a year ago that you'd be losing Marcus, you'd be losing Jarrett, you'd be losing Tremont Mark in a game where you lose Javier Francis, you're playing an 18 year old kid. And after it, you'd be sitting tied for first in big 12 play. I'd have been okay with that, <laughs> right? Like I don't think we need to get jumped to any other kinds of conclusions. Again, it feels like crap because we did play like crap, but it probably says something that would feel like Houston played like crap against Kansas in the most one of the most historically difficult places to play in America. Had a terrible shooting night while Kansas had a great shooting night. Got our butts kicked on the boards and still lost by just 13. I think that says something about this team. I think that says something about where this program can be. And frankly, I think that says something about where the rest of the season is going to go. Now, I mentioned Houston plays Oklahoma State on Tuesday. Houston also plays Cincinnati next weekend at Cincinnati, right? It looks like it might be a tough place to play. But weirdly, I think for most fans, that's actually neither of those are the biggest games of the week. And that's because it's the Super Bowl season. It is time for the Super Bowl. Happy Super Bowl to all people who celebrate from FanDuel, America's number one sports book. And if you're like me, Sunday can be all about scoring uh, the best in the couch or whatever. Now, if you're like me and you've listened to the show for a while now, you know, I get weird about the Super Bowl. Uh, I sit right in the middle of the couch. I put a spread on the table in front of me. I mean, pizza and wings, uh, all the food. And I want no one to talk to me. I want to be focused on the game. I don't want to miss a second of the play of the commercials, the halftime. I don't want to be interrupted at all. I want to see the entire thing. Now, if you're like me and you want to make this be as interested and invested in everything of this about this as possible, you got to go to FanDuel because right now, if you put down $5 on a bet and it wins, you get $200 back in bonus bets. And they've got the Kansas City Chiefs at plus two and a half. Did you know Kansas City Chief fan? Uh, Travis Kelsey's girlfriend, Taylor Swift's mom, went to the U of H. I feel like that's a good reason anything to put $5 down on Kansas City Chiefs at plus two and a half. And if that hits, you get $200 back in bonus bets. So it's fanduel.com slash locked on. Sign up at fanduel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more Fanduel, America's number one sportsbook and official sportsbook partner of the NFL. All right, so where does this loss put Houston? I mentioned that at 6-3, and three, they're tied with Kansas atop the Big 12. There are also three other teams that have five losses. Uh, Baylor, Iowa State, and Texas Tech all also have three losses, but they only have five wins, so they'll catch up in the next couple of days, right? Um, so theoretically, you're like in a weird quasi kind of five-way tie atop the conference, um, and you've beaten Tech, uh, you know you stacked up pretty well against Iowa State, lost by four at their place. Uh, you can see Baylor once later this year, and you can see Kansas one more time at least this season. Um, so you got to feel fairly comfortable about where you sit in the grand scheme of things there, right? I actually think there's a chance when the AP poll comes out on Monday or when the AP poll comes out maybe even a week from Monday and so like we start to process this loss – that Houston's like national prestige and ranking, again, 13-point loss in Fog Allen, is not actually hurt that much, especially when you factor in that over the same week, the week of death that we thought Houston might have had, they played Kansas State, Texas, and Kansas in an eight-day window. Houston went 2-1 and one on that window and only lost that one again by 13 in Fog Allen. Okay. Um, in that same week... 13 of the top 25 teams in America from last week's poll lost. Uh, five other top 10 teams lost. Wisconsin did it twice. Twice. Uh, Carolina lost to an unranked Georgia Tech team. Tennessee lost to an unranked South, uh, South Carolina. Wisconsin, I mentioned, lost twice. Once was to an unranked Nebraska team. Other was to Purdue. Purdue Duke lost that same Carolina team. Kentucky lost to Tennessee and an unranked Florida. Iowa State lost to an unranked Baylor. Creighton lost to an unranked Butler. Tech lost to TCU and an unranked Cincinnati. Utah State lost to San Diego State, who is currently unranked. New Mexico lost to an unranked Boise. Oklahoma lost to an unranked Central Florida. And TCU lost to an unranked Texas that Houston just beat. So I look at the top 25. 
And I see a bunch of teams that, frankly, had much, much, much worse weeks than Houston. Now, will Kansas leapfrog Houston in the, the AP Top 25? They absolutely should. I wouldn't be, frankly, I'm not a voter. They'd have my vote for number one team in America. If they beat the number four team by 13, uh, they're playing the Big 12 Conference. They're a share of the Big 12 Conference lead right now. I'd be putting them up there with my number one vote if I were voting based on the results. Things might change in March when they play again, but you feel me, right? Um, Carolina, you want to talk about beat a top 10 Duke team, but since the last ranking, they also lost to Georgia Tech, so where are they going to fall? Purdue should still be up there, right? Um, I, I get that. Da, 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 right. Um, Gonzaga, for what it's worth, also lost St. Mary's. That whole West Coast conference is going crazy. It's one, one of those teams is going to miss the uh, until the tournament. Um, as I look across the AP Top 25, I weirdly feel like there's a real world where Houston is still a top five team. And I, I know that that's me being somewhat horse blinders looking at the University of Houston, but UConn presumably holds spot at number one. Purdue presumably holds spot at number two. Carolina can't sit number three because they lost an unranked team, but also beat Duke. So I don't know how far they fall, but Houston, Tennessee, Wisconsin, Duke, all lost. So that means to me, Kansas moves up to number three, as painful as it is to say, right? Um, I could see Houston and Carolina both boying for that four spot. I mean, Carolina beat a top 10 team in Duke, so I, I guess they'll get that spot technically, but then does it, that put Houston at five? Are we, are we really looking at Houston as a five? Because once you get past Kansas, I mean, Marquette is doing fine in the Big East, I guess, um, but Houston beat a top, te- uh, top 25, I guess, Texas had just fallen out of the top 25, but on the road. So where does that fit in? Um, Kentucky, lost games. They're out. Arizona has a long way to jump from 11 to get up into the top five. Do they make it that far? Iowa State uh, lost a game, as we mentioned. Uh, Creighton lost a game, as we mentioned. You're looking at the rest of the top 25. Like Who moves? How many spots can you really move up after a game or two? And the only one I could see moving up to knock Houston out of the top five would be Arizona. So we're talking about a 6-7 spot. After the worst loss of the year, as far as point totals go, I'm okay with that. I think we'll be all right. I think we'll survive. The bigger thing to me is you can't let one loss turn into multiple, right? Houston played like crap against Kansas and lost by 13, got their teeth kicked in, doors blown off at the gates, whatever you want to say about it. Oklahoma State comes down on Tuesday. You can't let Kansas beat you twice. Watch the film, talk to the mistakes made. Listen to the game plan. Go and execute it. Let the home crowd tear them apart like you know they will at Fertitta. Can't let Kansas beat you twice. You also can then turn around. And now Cincinnati is a good home atmosphere. Nothing is like Kansas in the Big 12 as far as the atmosphere goes. And so you've got to make sure you go and prove that, hey, we can win road games. We just beat Texas. We just beat BYU. We can go to Cincinnati and win one too. You can go 2-0 in this week, and based on how much chaos happens in college basketball, you can be right back atop the Big 12 all on your own this time a week from now. And that's the beauty of college basketball. It's the randomness of college basketball. It's the fun part of college basketball. And it's the part you're going to be here talking about each and every day at Locked on Cougs. We follow all things Houston Cougars each and every day. So make sure you hit subscribe. Hit the bell on YouTube so you know when we're live. And we'll be back to talk to you again tomorrow about all things Houston Cougars getting ready for Oklahoma State basketball as well, as well as anything else that pops up between now and then. So make sure you subscribe again. Locked on Cougs, proud Locked on Packers. Your team every single day. Go Cougs.